Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Show Studio. Today we are going to be discussing the Dries van Noten Autumn Winter 2018 collection, which showed a couple of hours ago in Paris. Before we begin, let's have some introductions from the illustrious panel before me, beginning with Shona. I am Shona Marshall and I'm an independent fashion curator and writer. I am Caroline Burstein, daughter of the founder Joan Burstein of Browns and currently my baby is Brown's Bride. And I'm Navaz Batliwala. I'm a freelance editorial consultant and fashion writer. I'm Mima Viglitsu and I'm a creative consultant. And I'm Rosanna Falconer. I'm a freelance brand consultant. So, last year was a big year for Dries. He hit 100 catwalk shows, well, catwalk collections, and he marked the occasion with a celebratory two-tone book edited by Tim Blanks and Susanna Frankel. There was also a brilliant documentary on Netflix and one of the first things he says when interviewed on that documentary is about fashion. He's very articulate and I think it's a great place to begin. He says, we have to invent a new word for fashion. Fashion means something which is over after six months. I would like to find a word which is more timeless. That's what I'm aiming for. And I think that sums up how he defies industry convention. He is completely independent. He has 100% ownership of his com company, which he runs from Antwerp. He does not do pre-collections. He does not collaborate with mass brands. And his shapes, which often repeat season by season, are conventionally feminine. Um, and yet he has a global impact and a, he's a global success story. Um, Caroline, I'd like to turn to you to begin. Brown's was one of his first stockists of his first collection. We were his very first stockists, certainly here in, in the UK, um, and continued to stock his clothes. And every collection, every season was collections that we looked forward to seeing as buyers. Um, what we see when we see a show, we see an actual fraction of his range. His work, when you go into the showroom, is probably 20 times as big as what has been edited for us to see on the catwalk. And I think that's part of his secret, if you like, because there's such an amazing assortment and array of colours and shapes and forms that every individual store, including his own, are actually able to buy in their way for their customer. So the collection is very broad and very diverse. However, it's also, there's a, there's a tight edit that he manages to do and he balances both. And I think um, his family background is, was retail. His parents are retailers, were retailers, and I understand that they had stores a bit not unlike Brown's in those, as he was growing up. And as a, someone who, would, who looks at collections to look at what we can buy, not necessarily what's the most extraordinary looking piece on the catwalk, which is also wonderful to see, at the same time, you've got to know, and he understands, that his clothes have to sell. He doesn't have the luxury of having money behind him and being a fantasist. He is a realist, and his women are real women in his lives, and men, that all sorts of ages, shapes, and sizes look fantastic in his clothes, and they are timeless. They have a timelessness about them that's very, very special. And very rare. Um, and I think the, the notion that's really struck me is that in an age where I feel like we see, it, we see it every fashion month and we've seen it in the last few weeks, it feels often like the person who shouts the loudest makes the biggest impact. And I think young emerging designers might be tempted to go down that route. Mima, what, what are your thoughts there on well, shouting I, I, loudly? Well, I like to hear that because I think that especially in this season there has been a few I don't want to talk about others, but from New York through London to here that were whispering, so they didn't have massive um, setups and stuff, and then maybe they had the most interesting collection. So I am convinced that we're going back to the clothes. 
to the collections a little bit. But I would like to add something to what was so interesting you said, Caroline. Uh, I heard, I listened to um, an interview that he gave to Tim Blanks at a conference last December, and he said something that was very interesting. He said, I do big collections because I want my wholesalers to find their voice in my voice. Mm -hmm. But I also want every woman of any, as you said, shape and size to find something that works for her. However, I need to be creative and move forward with creativity, but I want it to be talking to people, which means relevant. So in a, in a way it says, if it doesn't sell, if it's not worn, I'm, I'm not interested. It's not what I'm here for. And I thought it was very interesting because as you said, it's quite rare. It is, and yet it's a format and a formula that works. The, the commercial success is undeniable and so pleasing to hear. Uh, he openly speaks about the time in the 90s when the industry changed and the models stopped smiling at shows and mm. a lot of his peers were bought by larger companies. Um, and, and yet, obviously, that's something he has been able to resist. Navaz, thoughts on, on, obviously, the points we've discussed have helped him do that, but other reasons? Yeah, I mean, I, what I like about him is his consistency. So, where other, other designers, especially at the moment, the ones that are making the loudest noises, I feel like they can tend to sort of veer from one kind of style to something else, you know, and then something, something else again and don't really have a recognisable handwriting because he's been doing it so long. He's got this recognisable handwriting. It's funny that you said very feminine because I think it's, at the moment it's, it's, it's weird describing something as feminine or masculine because I feel like it's quite an old fashioned way to describe yeah. things now. So I'm trying not to, but um, I think actually what he does really well is mixing traditional femininity and tra traditional masculinity to blurring the lines so that his women's wear will be kind of big, boxy tailoring like his women's tailoring is really great um but you know it's the fabrications isn't it it's the way he mixes um the embroidery and the prints that you know he does his own the fabric colors. and then the tailoring and then the styling and just the combination of those things um the casting and, and everything as well it's just that thing that makes he looks make it look so easy but if you've seen the film, if you've read interviews with him, you know that everything is very meticulously considered. Um, and as you said, you know, he's very commercially minded. So it's creative, but at the end of the day, it's stuff that you know you can wear. And um, I can't remember who said it, but you know, however old you are, whatever shape you are, you feel like you can wear it. It doesn't feel like it's out of your league. And you know, at the moment, a lot of things feel quite young on mm. the catwalk. Mm. And yes, that might just be the way it's presented on the catwalk. And then you go in the store and it's broken up into merchandise and you can buy it. But I feel like like whether you see it on the catwalk or whether you see it in the store, you always feel like there's something that you can buy. And one more thing is it always, you know, you can buy something from this collection and wear it with something from six seasons ago or anything in your wardrobe and it will work with that. And, so. he, and he's openly aware of that. And I think that hits the nail on the head about what he mentioned at the start of the documentary. He hates this idea of fashion being passed at sell by date in six months time. And I imagine you come across that in when curating always, what you always try to look for the timeless pieces. Well, yeah, interestingly, I've just done a project um, that's all about contemporary fashion photography. I've just finished a book. And I was thinking about something was kind of thrashing around my head when you guys were talking about that kind of commercial image. And, and the whole project hinges on, you know, really the usefulness or the function of a fashion photograph. I was really interested when Dries sort of said, you know, he doesn't like fashion advertising because it's this one image that's supposed to sum up what he says is 150 pieces, mm. all of these different ideas he's had and they click together. But just looking at these women for the hundred, like the hundredth show, I, I, I want to look like them. <laughs> They're just so intoxicating and I think that's where he really for me he sings and I think that's when fashion or whatever you would like to call it if he wants to return it really that's its potency and I think you know I remember because I was doing or maybe I'd finished the Sam McKnight exhibition, but Sam does the hair for the shows. Mm. And I remember seeing this and Sam obviously knew a lot of these models when they were kind of modelling um, as teenagers and, and it was really nice, you know, lots of pictures with them together and sort of friendship came through and I just think they all looked like they had so much fun. 
And I think that's when it sort of gets it right. And, and you know, the whispering versus the kind of loud shebang. I don't know. I just think there's such a sense of confidence that runs throughout someone like Dries van Newton's collections and him clearly as a man. And just to look at the exhibition that he did in Paris, it, uh, apparently, I read 20% of the objects were from his own collections. Mm. The sense of confidence to do something like that, because I've worked with people and it's not necessarily where you go to when you were doing something like that. And he wanted to explore what interested him. And I mm. think that's very interesting. But can I say something? Because that's very interesting when you say, you know, again, it's whispered, it doesn't need much bang around. And yet he says that the fashion show is the most important moment. Yeah. So he believed in these moments. And that's why for his anniversary, it wasn't 20 years or whatever, it was a hundred catwalks. Yeah. And, and he, he gives a lot of importance on putting women on his catwalk and showing women that they can be one. I don't know if I'm making sense, but, and, 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 and yet he doesn't need big setups. He just needs some styling, some way of presenting things. And, and I think that's very interesting. And when we were talking about commercial, another thing that I'm very interesting about, interested about is that he's not commercial in the bad way. I mean, this is fashion. He is a fashion designer, yet he manages to be interesting in a commercial way. Mm, I agree. Which is not always easy. It, it's true. He, he really has an understanding. And I think it's, as, as I say, I think he, it's his love of all the things that are personal, that, that all his travels, and which you see in, in, you know, in that fabulous exhibition that he did in, in Paris, where he brings all all his years together and we can you can see them it's a bit like I was looking through the, his two books last night just to refresh myself and I thought it struck me as it's one beautiful story going all the way through and it's as you said there's it's not one thing one season or another it's a continuum and in that continuum there is this this confidence and this strength as if it's building and building and building and just getting stronger we talk about him being feminine because he's got florals. They're not frilly, you know, um, what's the word, when they're sort of watered down frilly florals. Oh, girly. They're not, they are, they're yeah. strong florals. They are bold and, and even if the most delicate pieces are still, even in their fragility, their strength. And I think it's a, it's a huge, as you were saying, confidence understanding he's now been doing this for thir over 30 years and um, I think it's, it's a wonderful tribute to a man and also having been year in year out behind the scenes sort of buying going into the showroom and spending hours there making our selection for Browns um, what always struck me is his team there's such a strong teammanship and they all work as one there's, we're taken care of as a customer. There's always, as he said, but there's always sort of attention to detail and he knows he has to look after his customers just as we in that business have to look after our customers. And it's, it's that understanding. And I think a lot of designers forget that. They sort of cut themselves off from the end, you know, what is their, and return really mm. which is which is us all of us mm. that um, want to buy want to wear clothes that we feel beautiful in comfortable in and men as well I mean his menswear is so lovely there's so many individual pieces and, and any man can look and feel good in all his clothes it's quite an achievement and it, it's for me it's interesting as somebody who loves to wear color and print and a lot of my peers and friends are always surprised by how often I do. He pulls off colour and print with aplomb. I think there's no colourist with an eye like his. And he juxtaposes them. It's all in the mixed, as well as embellishment. How is his approach to colour different to other designers out there? That's a big question. Well, I'm really obsessed with the uh, like, yeah. eye for colour as a general interest. 
I've been really interested how you can learn it over years and years and years by seeing lots and lots of things. Mm -hmm. And I think, sorry to go, obviously so boring, the curator talking about the exhibition, but that <laughs> kind of showed how he'd trained this eye to see so many different things. And I think you can see that in the way he approaches colour because there's bravery and it's mm. really extraordinary pairings that potent I always think colours potentially you wouldn't work and then they look so glorious together, but you hadn't thought about it. And he kind of really seems to be able to mix or remix or kind of put things together. Like there was the kind of camel and orange and red at the top of mm. what we were scrolling through just now. And I think that's really, really interesting. And he's clearly got a real interest in art. And then I you think it's a confidence travels. thing as well. I think yeah. the more you do it, the more confident and adventurous you get. And also remember, he's like obsessed with gardening and flowers and his yeah, garden. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's that thing where it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, you see this flower next to that flower and the light is whatever he's the light is. Like, mm -hmm. think, yeah. in his downtime, he, he travels and we, we all know he has, you know, he works with a lot of resources in, in India and in, in the Far East so where colour there is, it explodes everywhere. Mm. And I think that I, it's for sure he's drawn from that. You can see sun and shadows and, you know, you go to India, I mean, you, you can just be blind, just put your camera anywhere and it's inspirational. So and you can see that he, that, and he says, I think he says that, you know, he draws inspiration as well. From and do you think that another one who does colour in the same fantastic way is Haider Ackerman? And mm -hmm. uh, they come from the same school, so is there something there? Mm -hmm. Because one thing that I notice in Haider shows is this but, just a, a, yeah. putting together colours that apparently <laughs> just... <laughs> just <laughs> of colors and um the you know those browns and golds and greens and then and uh, he comes from the same mm. school from the same background so I've probably i don't know maybe there's something there as well yeah, that they, they look and they see and they come from the north of europe where you can think about anything but not color i mean it's not yeah. like it's true flamboyant and it's very good it's very true. protestant and gray and and yet they probably the masters of that mm. interesting mm. certainly is and and i think it just it feels very refreshing to see it used in a way that's consistent collection by collection the same with you mentioned um the artisans that he works with in india um the same with his approach to embellishment does anybody, was that more what you picked up on when shop buying at Brands or was it the no. colours that your customers? It, it, you know, every collection is, is fresh and, is, and is, is new and is a different story and we would, you'd want to balance because the embroidered pieces are usually the most expensive so you would definitely have a little, you know, have that because it was strong and it's for that woman who can afford it and who'll go for it and uh, who'll, who'll love it. And then there are all the other things which are for any of us to wear, you know, to go to work, for, you know, on our daily lives. They are really wearable clothes mm -hmm. and beautiful evening wear, but it's always relaxed. There's always coats. something relaxed Amazing about coats. his collections. Mm -hmm. They're never forced. And uh, for women with personalities that don't want to be walking in and going, you know, loudly, here I am, but subtly, here I am. It's perfect Elegantly, yeah. for that. And does he have a cult following in a store? I mean, does he have the same clients that come back again and again and again? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. It's, and we would, when we were buying, we would have, oh, Think there's this person, and this is this person, this would be perfect for that person. Yes, in, indeed, and... Uh, I'm not surprised. Would you agree yeah. he's quite a fashion name, though? You know, I'm just thinking, you know, if my mum would know who Drews van Nostrum was or something like that, I don't know how I his I think name... I like the fact that he's... It's not an it name. Like, it sounds really snobby, but I like the fact that someone yeah. like Kim Kardashian probably wouldn't wear it, or, like, those hype beast type people mm. wouldn't wear it. So you feel like it's a bit of an insidery thing as well as the fact that you just like the clothes, so mm. obviously that's really why you're buying them. But there is, you know, the kind of people that, that like it, you know, there are a lot of arty, designy 
type people in the creative industries that really like it. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, just speaking for myself, I like the fact that it's, it's kind of like a quiet label, but if you know, you know, like you can, you can say to someone, oh, are you wearing trees? Or not because you recognize that exact piece, but it's just got a bit of a feeling about it mm. and a consistency. Mm. But that's why probably the retailers were so always important in this. Yeah. In this trajectory, in this path, because you were the one who, more than the press or, you know, the celebrities, the ones who made it known to mm. those women that that were that exactly. then were coming back again and again. I remember the first time I heard this name, I was still living in Rome and I wasn't working really in fashion and um, and and there was this the Browns of Rome. What was the name of the boutique? Anyway, the a little boutique in Rome that sells all the brands and. The owner was talking, I was in there trying something and she was like, Dries here and Dries there and I talked to Dries and I just, we were like, Dries who? And apparently then we asked her and she said, it's my best seller. And it, we're talking 15 years ago. How, He's always how long in, has it been around? 20 years? 20? 1986. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, he's been around since the 80s, but I don't think I was really that into him until like maybe 10 years ago. I kind of feel like... You were too young before. Oh God, no, actually. <laughs> I feel like um, he's... Maybe because there's so many kind of noisy brands around at the moment, he's sort of cut through a bit more maybe, you know, recently. Bit more probably yeah. Yeah. I think his collections have become stronger and mm. more punchy. With, with the, in, the, in the last few years. And, and that's why I say I think it's, they're building and building. And I think because he's aware of all the noise around him that he, he sort of, but what's lovely, instead of going into other directions, he's just making what he's doing edgier and stronger. I mean, you can wear his clothes in a very edgy way. And some pieces yeah. are, you know, they're challenging to wear for, but at the same time you can, mix it up and wear it in any way you know this is all styles so you'll know for for that skirt there'll be a matching top if you really want that and a jacket all in the same fabric there'll be fabrics they're fabric stories that he creates and then we go and put our own palettes and you see that when you go into his flagship in Antwerp which is a very beautiful yeah. building and a very beautiful store you even you can buy or not dress wear or not dress you go in there you're like in a so museum lovely the colors and it's and it's merchandise in a way that it's, it's yummy you want everything right mm. so i think it's particularly uh, you can see the strength of what he does when there is a lot of it i think as well he's clearly got really good ideas in the age of everyone being curated like oh. <laughs> <laughs> which they are they all are curators breakfast instagram <laughs> he's clearly obviously has got it so i think he really does and i think his approach to that exhibition was curatorial it wasn't from a designer and i think that's why it was so fantastic and well received and brilliant but i also think perhaps thinking through an exhibition and books and a documentary maybe you do become a bit punchier and you kind of do start to think about oh maybe that did work for me or i'll revisit that or that's quite interesting i'm always intrigued about how he hasn't fallen for the cult of the celebrity which our world hinges on in terms mm. of media now it just does so whether you like it or not doesn't matter but he has um done other things which have communicated his message in such a chic way and i think that that might have meant that he's kind of well his communication he, he's done it in his own way and he has risen his brand profile doing that i mean you know how does that for, for you as a brand yeah person, I think don't I'm forget he's also a private company so oh, he yes, can do what yes, he wants he yes. doesn't need to give profits back to the shareholders yes. he doesn't need a 30 percent growth year on year to keep the stock up you know what i mean and and he said it once i don't know i don't remember where but he said if one year i don't want to make money i don't make money so i mean that's great mm -hmm. that's why it's great that he kept yeah. himself private he can do what he likes in that sense he can do what he likes he can lose money if he wants if he but can it afford seems it seems to be working I mean, if we, approach, <laughs> if we approach his current trajectory through a prism of, of what's going on uh, around him and 
thing, the show is being questioned by a lot of designers. Think of the change at New York Fashion Week on the schedule in, in London as well. Likewise, online, he doesn't have e-commerce. He His approach to Instagram is exactly how I would expect. It is quiet and it, it has a huge amount of integrity. Backstage at the show, I know he usually doesn't give press interviews. He doesn't do a press release. He released a very well edited video four minutes after the show, a four minute video that was released after the show. How do you think he can approach this digital age in five years time? Do you think the show format will still work for him in that way? Do you think he can still, uh, you're my, always my future gazing partner. Um, do you think he can still stick to this? I think it'll stand out by then in five years time as something unique, even more unique because else. no one else knows how to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question because like none of us really know what's gonna happen in one or two years time. If you compare like five years ago to now, it's like social media didn't even exist. So I'm not really sure what would take over. Um, I'll just figure out a way to do something that's consistent with his brand. I quite like the fact that he doesn't feel like he has to do Instagram stories or whatever, or put his face out there. I found it quite disappointing when, when Nicolas Gesquier, who I always thought is a behind the scenes kind of person, was just like all over Instagram and just doing selfies and stuff. I was like, no, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. So, um... But that's vanity more than modernity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just... um, I'll tell you a story. We, a few years ago now, when, um, you know, sh shopping online and Browns were, we were we were re realizing that we could, that we had to have an online presence. channel presence. and presence and we were finding our way and of course we wanted to have Dries on board and he took an awful lot of persuasion and he wouldn't do it in fact until we, and we couldn't afford to do this as a company, could have the, the money had to be the same all over the world, wherever you bought, because he didn't want his shops in France or anywhere else losing out, because people, the people who shop online are shopping usually wherever the price is cheaper. So they'll go for whichever website can offer the best price for the same thing, and he was not going to be drawn into that. And I really f you know, feel that that also is a really good example of how he thinks very carefully about every step that he does and every, every commercial move that he makes and considers all aspects of it. And he's not looking to make a short buck when at the end of the day it can damage, you know, something further along the mm. line. He sort of looks at the road ahead very carefully and then makes the decision. And that's why he's had such long-term success, I think, yeah. you know. Absolutely. I think he is really intelligent. And I don't know, I think, obviously the e-commerce has its place. I don't really shop online that much for fashion. I like to go into a store and I think with his, with his types of products, as you said, like when I've been in the flagship in Paris, it's like a world that you enter and you know, you love being in a physical mm -hmm. store. So it's almost an event to, to go and buy it from a physical store. And you've got the option of buying it from like, you know, Browns or any kind of like multi-brand e-commerce. But, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for having really beautiful. It's funny how- the world that you create. But it's funny how I'm not, I wouldn't even think about that for Dries van Noten, wrongly probably, because we know that Prada paid the price of being last, you know. I, I don't know, does it matter for Dries? It's smaller, no, no. it's again private. Yeah, yeah and I feel it. like there was, uh, there's, there was a lot of emphasis on Chanel being late online or Prada, like you say, and yet nobody's actually, when I went on his site today, I didn't expect to be able to shop his pieces on an own brand e-commerce site and I yeah I don't it's as you say it feels also, in keeping it's not a millennial brand mm. I think it's a brand more for women mm. you know mature women uh, well and, I think uh, you so say you say that but maybe in like five years time he's probably going to be thinking hang on like my customer's getting older I need to start targeting Gen well, Z. From the casting and what he does, it doesn't seem to really care about Gen Z, mm. does he? <laughs> he wants it for, for everyone. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, these are, I have no idea in reality, but I don't really think it matters for Dries, but he will 
I don't know. Well, should we watch the show? Yeah, that would be and great. See if it has. Can I just say one quick thing? Of course, well, while it's beginning. Quickly, mm. Just to say, I think it's quite refreshing and it seems like real clothes for real women still works. Mm. And what a relief. Oh, well, yes. That's nice to know. Yeah. You know, yes. there's a f no, I quite agree, yeah. Here we are. Here we are. So, as I mentioned, he, rather than a press release, there's a one-on-one -on -one interview with him backstage that was released to journalists just after the show. And he speaks, he's, the key motif this season, the key inspiration is this idea of a free hand and a free spirit. The thing that really stuck with me from his interview is he said, this is the kind of woman who has a relaxed ease to her, even if she's wearing feathers. And I thought, well, that's, that's something cool. to aim for all round. <laughs> um, he, as you'll see in these prints here, they are, it's exquisite. Obsessive, obsessive doodling. doodling he called it. Yes. I think it's fantastic. The one that we just saw, mm. and you can imagine yourself being on the phone and literally creating that print, you know? And within the same video, actually, he did, there was a, the, I, I, a time lapse video of this actual print being made by hand, um, which was beautiful to see, drawn with biro and then uh, completed with colour. He does separate also very, very well, as you were saying, you know, he could, you could buy the same shirt and, and, and skirt, but I think that's also very democratic, you know, by doing so many separates, it gives me the possibility to style mm. the way I want. But I still think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline, that his coats and his tailoring, especially in winter, you know, his winter are just amazing. Yeah, I, mean, I think it does. You're absolutely right. There's outerwear in a superb way. Superb, yeah. Someone said to me the other day that they, it was such a nice point, it was Holly Hay, and she was saying that style, she thinks styling's coming back, and it's through uh, things like fashion photography that there is this play where you can layer up information and different looks and take from different places, and for quite a long time it did feel like there was something about the full look, whether you liked it or not, it sort of felt quite present. I don't know if you agree with that in terms of contemporary fashion, but... I liked that idea that you could kind of start to wear something that was like a hoodie from um, yeah. Unicorn. That makes it match. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think that started for a, for a commercial need, for an economical need, meaning that things were not going, not going as well. So, you know, I remember like about 10 years ago, or eight years ago, whatever, it was all about dresses. It was, you know, that Roland Moray dress or that Antonio Berardi dress, which uh, it was never, but I mean, women, you were going to cocktails or dinners and they were all wearing that dress. And, um, and then you would like it or not. And so the brands would sell it or not. Yeah. And then, you know, and then separates started coming also because people realized that the the customer wanted to style things the way they wanted and mix and match and then and then Vetmo and Gucci came around and they made it like the thing to do you just do what you want you buy things and you wear them how you want and I call it the fashion liberation I think it's very good but I also think and again Karen correct me if I'm wrong he always did it Dries right he always offered separates always to let you do it the way you want it, yes. right? It's all about doing it the way you want. And is that the way that your customers approached it, really? Yes, they did as well. Yes, they do. They do. We will suggest, I mean, we'll help. The, the, the sales team are there to help suggest and style and style them. Um, but you could pick up a piece. I mean, I have, I have a lot of Dries, and it will be a, a piece that I bought you know, a few years ago, and then I'll see something that's come this season, and I'll go, oh, wow, that'll go so well with that piece that I bought, you know, a few years ago, and suddenly it has a new life. I mean, we do that with our wardrobes with all, in all sorts of ways anyway, but he's, he's very much, it's, you can do it your way, it's do it your look, I mean. And yet there are designers that impose to the press, for instance, their own vision, so you can only pull the total look, yeah. Nicolas Josquier, Phoebe Philo, mm. um, probably Edith Sliman. So 
you know, he really stands apart. He doesn't do um, pre-collections. He just does it his way and it works. The Why? Thing of, because the, he's a good designer. Yeah, and the idea of not doing pre-collections really struck me and stayed with me, having worked at Matthew Williamson and knowing the pressure to do pre-collections and then the pressure... From retail. That come, the pressure from buyers to do uh, yeah. pre-collections and then the pressure on the design team that that brings about. It, I just thought, what light relief. I mean, he's still, it's still four collections a year. It's still menswear and womenswear, but he stood his ground and is keeping with mainline. But I think it's because, like, you know, the fabrics take so much time that it means, and that's his passion, so it means that he can put the time into that. Because mm. if he was trying to do twice as many, there just wouldn't be the time and you wouldn't enjoy it. Mm. I think all that... But he also said I wouldn't have the ideas that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's really... Uh, I, you know, watching fashion and watching these over the years, it's come from America, the, the pre-collections and the other, and driven by the department stores who are in competition with the other department stores that's actually started this whole thing um, about so many collections. And then in order to get the customer, you can buy in, I don't know what you know which brands, you can buy it straight, you're the customer, and you can go and buy that straight away, right oh, now. By now, see now, I by mean, now, yeah. I feel it's, it must be exhausting, and I think this is partly why the industry is driving itself into a, burrowing itself into a hole, digging itself in a hole it can't get out of easily. And I think, to, yeah, and, and to pull off See Now, Buy Now, it, it needs to be such a gargantuan brand. Tommy Hilfiger, Burberry, cases in point. You know, it's all that offered the budget. What's wrong required. with waiting? But the sad thing is that instead of high street trying to be like luxury, it was the opposite. So they have this business model where they renew their assortment so quickly also because it's made by, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's copied and then it's made quickly. And so like the Zara that were reassorting the store completely every two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. it, and, 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 and the industry, instead of saying, okay, that's their thing, they started adapting. And I remember at the beginning at Gucci Group, my boss was saying, we should follow the Zara model. And we were like, we create, they, they copy, copy. Yes. Yeah, I even went to visit them, yeah, mm. and that was, and, but that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> it's true. He was right, people did it. Yeah. I mean, it was right, I still think it was wrong, but people did it. I think that the more we go on, the better it gets. It's so interesting. Uh, the collection? Yes. Yes, I quite agree. This collection. Is that a take on a peacock feather. Looks like it, doesn't it's it? Very happy. The prints are fantastic. Yeah, I love those big coats. And my favorite pieces, I think, are the, are the pieces in the, in the front. They're so strong, the doodles. Oh, those. Remind mm, me yeah. a bit of the um, of Aboriginal art when you look at it. It's sort of traveling, traveling in your mind. Mm. He, these are gorgeous, gorgeous colors. That's beautiful dress. He said that he referenced, uh, well, he in the studio referenced Art Brute, which is known as outsider art. So those, the kind of eye not trained by an art mm. school um, on the edge of the establishment. And again, it's that idea of this impulsive creativity at the heart of the collection. So I suppose that does the Aboriginal art does some. Um, mm. In fact, in my- It's very beautiful, look at this. Mm. Look at that juxtaposition, yes. Yeah. In researching Dries, I'm always struck, there is such positivity towards his brand and such love for his brand. The only time I ever saw anything edging close to controversy is uh, in his, which is obviously a hot topic for this year, the cultural appropriation. And uh, he openly references, um, I, he, one of my favorite, anecdotes is that one of the ICATs he used had to travel by donkey for three days mm -hmm. before it reached a DHL uh, depot to come to the studio and he openly says he's inspired by his travels and he's very proud about that and he says what am I meant to be doing just referencing Belgium folklore that's not possible what do you think of that a small polemic, I suppose, around... But I think he does credit part. where he got his inspiration from. He doesn't just, like, you don't just suddenly see something appear. He will say, mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, this is made in India, or this is inspired by Indian, blah, blah, blah. So you kind of do know where the cultural 
references came from. Whereas I think the big problem people have is when it's it's used, but there's no credit to where it originated. Although saying that, I think you know. It is a hot topic, very controversial. <laughs> Some people just do want to be angry about stuff. Yeah. Um, and I get, you know, I'm a bit bored with that. And <laughs> it's so personal where you get your references from. You know, sometimes you, you don't know where the very first example of something started. To you, it started from this place, you know, from going out clubbing and seeing people wearing X. And genuinely, that's how you, that's how you were inspired. That's that was your reference point and maybe it did originate two decades earlier somewhere else but you might not have known that mm. but that's not I think that's fine absolutely and I think there is a difference by being inspired by color or prints or a way to wear something and taking that culture and putting it on your catwalk exactly like that so I mean I'm, a, I'm I, I don't know exactly what I think about this new, as you said, you know, people are angry and mm. you, you get cut out for everything now and it's a little bit annoying. But at the same time, you know, again, I, I listened to his interview with Tim Blank and he said, I don't decide that I won't be inspired by India and so I travel to India for three months. But I, when I'm in my studio, I think, oh, I remember when I was in that country, that color, or that thing, and then that's where my inspiration starts. But then it doesn't mean I study it. No, it, no he said I'm not literal. I, I'm sorry, I, that's what I said. It, he is not literal. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to be literal. And yeah. I said, when you're not literal, nobody can accuse you. Of, yeah, of, absolutely. Of I think if he was literal, we'd all be bored to death by now. It wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, exactly. it wouldn't be 30 <laughs> years on. No, the, ho the whole point is it's, it's, a, it's a starting point of inspiration. Mm. I think we should have a look at this because it's really... His and his team. Oh, I know, absolutely. Everything in it. Yeah. Look at the colour. Look at the line-up of the colours. Yeah, it's and like it's an ombre and the catwalk. How they're kind of like... Mm. And it's true what you were saying. I mean, it's just... You just want to wear it. <laughs> Which is not a bad thing in fashion. Yeah, well, his is actually one of the brands which would probably work incredibly well for Sina Mai now because it is instantly desirable. And yet we have to wait and we must. Do we know the size of his business? Do we have an idea? It's, I have no it's idea. It's mooted at 30... Uh, hang on, now I'm going to misquote. Mooted at 30 million euros. But it's of really course, small. because it's a private company, he can't, yeah. that's just... It's, it's, it's quite small it's still, yeah. yeah. But you know, it's him. doesn't disclose. Yeah, no, it doesn't. But that's why I, I didn't know if we had some... Insider track. No, or some, you know, the, the, the people they, they, they project, they, they, whatever. Mm. Our money is private, but we know that it is above 10 billion. So, you know what I mean? So, I don't know, it's quite small, 30 mm. million. It's smaller than... Stella McCartney, it's smaller than, and it's been around longer. In, I think it was in that same Tim Blank's interview, he said um, he really would hate for the brand to become so big that he wasn't quite so hands-on and was just sitting in meetings telling people what to do. And so perhaps that's the yeah. happy medium for it's the brand. His, I think it's, his cho it's his choice. I think it's, it's him alone, he doesn't need a billion probably. Yeah, just he probably is happy. able to turn around, you know, he's not greedy. Mm. He's happy, this gives him quality of life and... Exactly. Just, I think that's what he show. values and I don't think he's sold his quality of life for his brand. You obviously know him personally, right? I I've guess. met him, I've met him. He's, he's a nice person, I guess. Very nice person. Really a decent human being. Mm. Very nice indeed. Mm. Laura, could we have a look at some details, please? You know that I don't know if it's true and maybe you know but um, once I was in Antwerp and someone told and he, he was there so I briefly met him but I can't really say I met him but anyway someone told me that every year he finance the award monetary award for the winner of the master you know the end of year master collection there's always one who I think gets 5,000 euros of something that might be wrong the figure but that he finances it every year with the money that he gets from suing people that copy. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's that that is such a good story, story that I don't know if it's real or not, but if it is, it's like every year he sues 
probably some high street on a shirt or on something, you know, high street, they don't care. They yeah. pay because they, exactly. it's better for them to be sued and pay and then, and then do it again and sell a lot. So, and so Dries, like everybody else, sues and he gets some money and, and he gives that to the school. Is it true? I don't know, but it's a good story. <laughs> it's a very good story. So he, he spoke in the interview about mixing uh, Afghan faux fur and feathers with these very sporty fabrications and sporty cuts. Is what we can see here. So Afghan faux fur, does it mean it's like Afghan wool? Like the Afghan coat, or? like sh the shaggy Shilling. Afghan. Yeah, but that's not faux, that's an animal. But he's done it faux. His oh, he faux. imitates the Afghan long. Mm. Okay, got it. Yeah, very specifically faux. But look at the doodling. I mean, you really recognize what. Mm. Th there's also the, the suit with the little squares, you know, when you're on the phone and you fill in mm. little squares on your, on your book. That looks exactly like that. I love it. <laughs> the one earring. Mm. He doesn't really go in for like, the it bags, but he does do really good bags. He does great bags, great shoes, great eyewear. But it's not kind of like rammed down your throat. It's just like, it's just always there. Do great home, wouldn't he? He would, wouldn't he? Truly. Yeah. yeah. So we write to him. To do like <laughs> fabrics it. for curtains and pillows. Yeah. Or porcelains. Mm. Yeah. I, it would be such an obvious next step. Does I don't he, think he wants he want to be bigger. <laughs> Gardening tools. Well, I think that's the thing. So usually to move into home, again, just speaking from the Matthew Williamson perspective, it requires licensing because exactly. you need the production scale and expertise that a licensed partner can bring. And I think that is something that he would want to avoid. I Probably I wear his licensing, right? It is How can Linda he do it Farrow, himself? The same as Matthew Williamson. Okay. So I think his, so his eyewear is licensed with Linda Farrow yeah. and then his shoes are made in collaboration, but it's not a license. But I think they feel, I, the Linda Farrow one is, I think at least 10 years established and it feels very in keeping and, and the styling of the sunglasses and the show feels very mm. easy. I think if the right company came along, you know, with the right yeah, product it's not that like he something. felt yeah. for and he felt he could collaborate with them, he would probably, why, why would he not do it? Um, it's probably not felt that that's happened yet for him. I would, I would imagine. What about the jewellery? Is, is that Dries van Noten jewellery? It's street those so earrings, jewelry, is, yeah. yes. But I think he collaborates as well with that, with the jewelry. I think, and I think it changes from design from season to season. And does he do perfume? Excuse me. I don't know. No. I think he has. Wait, I know. I'm making sweet not statements. Sure. So I don't think he does. Yeah, he's done a perfume with Frederick Thank Marle. You. Thank I'm you. Oh, right. that's right, with Frederick Marle. Yeah. Huh? Yes, of course, yes, that was yeah, why. Well, I, and again, I think that was because, you know, he really wanted to do it. And, yeah. and yeah. yeah, it was a genuine thing. Thank you, Navaz. Encyclopedia to my left. <laughs> but exactly, I do think that if uh, going from, from experience with Matthew Williamson and, and then other designers with whom it can be such a success, if I think one-off collaborations are what he spoke about with Tim Blanks, not liking the idea of, I'm sure we can all think of mass one-off collaborations that have and haven't worked, but these long-term partnerships can be fantastic. And the, the way he juxtaposes fabrics and prints and color, wow, in a room that would be sensational. I want this suit. <laughs> Lovely. And did you notice that the makeup, the, the, every model has a different mascara color? Mm. And the same flash through the Yeah, line. it's quite, quite interesting. Leather in the party. Yeah, because it's something. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. And once they gilded the parting, and that's just so beautiful. Mm, yeah. I don't know, partings really always feature. I wonder why. True. Not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I spent three years thinking about hair. <laughs> it's funny though, because it's like, it's so, you know, the styling and the hair and makeup, it's so key and it, it's so easy to overdo stuff mm, like that. I like I did see another show earlier in the week, I won't say who it was, but it was so overstyled and it didn't need to be like that. And I think, you know, it's again, the juxtaposition, everything is so perfectly done. And actually, if you see the film, 
he talks about how stressful it is backstage because he hasn't got his list and he can't remember like you know this goes with this and I think he does have a stylist but he is very hands-on so it's it's meticulously thought out but it looks it almost looks like each person well probably they do do it for each model has their look and you know this girl's going to wear this so it doesn't feel like homogenized it does feel like individuality which is obviously what he celebrates um but the beauty look i'm always really interested in because you know he's not a show off his statement he brand but there's always something interesting it's not minimalist there's always yeah like the partings or the eyes or the um yeah. one year he did like an amazing pink chanel lipstick on all the girls but they all looked it's always a detail it's who does it who does the makeup some it's probably right who's who does the makeup so now McKnight does have yeah. I think it's Peter, Peter Phillip. Phillip. Okay. Mm. Yeah. It's very good because it looks like nonchalant and actually it's very studied, you know, with mm. those parting and, and the mascara great. and mm. and natural lips. It's, it's very beautiful makeup, I think. Fantastic makeup actually. <laughs> and very good show. I quite agree. So we're um, so quiet. We're quiet. We are like so quiet. We are in awe, aren't we? <laughs> and I think it really does come down to the fact that it, there is this huge positive feeling towards him as a designer, towards the brand, and towards as a the human fact being. That now he's done 102 collections, which is a wonderful achievement. So thank you very much, Dries, and thank you to all of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Round of applause.